So it's wonderful to be here at a design conference because um, I've dedicated the past 20 years of my life to really thinking about this idea of waste and what are the inherent design flaws with the, with the very concept. You know, I think to me waste is an incredibly interesting idea because you know, for how gargantuanly big it is, I mean, everything that we own, every object we see will one day belong to the garbage industry. I mean, with no exception. And to put a cherry on the cake, we'll even pay them to take it. For how big that is, it's incredibly uninnovative what we end up doing with it. You know, most of waste is put in a pile uh, or burned, and some small uh, fraction of it is recycled, and that fraction itself is even declining. And I think one of the key issues here, and the reason we haven't thought about how do we design away from waste, is because it's incredibly undesirable to be in the waste industry. I mean, my parents made jokes you know, with me when I was a, a student, actually growing up here in Toronto, that if I don't study hard and don't work hard at school, I'll be a garbage man when I grow up. And it's, I mean, tremendously ironic now. But, <laughs> you know, did, did any of you ever aspire to be in the waste industry, ever? Anyone here? I mean, that's the point. It's totally nuts. I, was, uh, I do this talk uh, to the students of NYU every year, the freshman class, and uh, it's always a fun thing to ask, you know, does anyone want to be in the garbage industry? No one puts up their hand. Then when you ask how many people want to be bankers, it's like 30% of the audience put up their hand and talk about an industry where there's no value creation. It's just moving from A to B. So I want to give you some context a little bit in what we've been doing all over the world, including here in Canada. Uh, so TerraCycle today uh, operates in 21 countries around the world, uh, including here. And uh, we are, in our heart, a garbage company. In fact, Waste Connections, a Canadian garbage company, owns 25% of our Canadian operation here. And that idea exists in Europe and Japan and Brazil and so on. And we have one central mission, which is not to manage waste, but to eliminate the idea of waste. And uh, to do that, uh, the first thing we do is uh, think about those waste streams that are today not recyclable. And by the way, if you take a step back, what makes something recyclable or not recyclable has nothing to do with the design of the object. Right? People think it has to do with the equipment to, to recycle it or those sort of you know, things, but it has everything to do with money. Right? What makes a, uh, a soda bottle made, say, from PET plastic recyclable is a garbage company can make money recycling it, while what makes a toothbrush not recyclable is that a garbage company would lose money recycling it. That's it. It's just the profitability to a waste management company. And so the first thing that uh, we do to get some context is uh, we try to help make those things that are not recyclable, recyclable, from cigarette butts to dirty diapers to, in this example, aerosol containers with hundreds and hundreds of waste streams. And uh, in, to make that happen, what we try to do is create value outside just the waste stream uh, uh, to be able to get funding to make it recyclable. Just to show you a couple of quick examples, this is in Germany uh, with DM, which is the leading pharmacy there, sort of like the shopper's drug mart of, uh, of the country. And here uh, we run a program with DM where we manage that kiosk to collect different things, but we added in this example aerosol containers. Um, uh, through funding from Unilever, we, will now, we were now able to collect aerosol containers across all of the country. And for every 400 containers collected and recycled, we made it into a bicycle for a child in need. That's sort of one example of a construct that we would put together. Or just a few months ago, we launched chewing gum recycling in Mexico City. Uh, now you can go and see these bins all over the city uh, to be able to collect and recycle chewing gum. The same thing exists now in hundreds of cities, including Toronto, across the word, world for cigarette butts. Um, all the way to uh, just a month ago, we ran a massive program in the United States to collect and recycle car seats. Um, this is a Target. We also ran it at Walmart. In the first two days in the Walmart program, we collected a million car seats. Just to put that into perspective, that's 2,000 full truckloads of car seats, just for a, from a volumetric point of view. And I want to just peel back the, the layer a little bit to un help you understand how do you get an organization to do something like this? Because, you know, if you turn aerosols into bikes or recycle car seats, that's wonderful things, but none of these things make economic sense. So again, what makes a car seat not recyclable is it costs more to collect and process than it's worth. And so what we try to do is peel back the layer to think about other ways to drive value. What does a retailer care about? They care about selling stuff. That's their core reason of being. And so we constructed a program like this, which we call a trade up and save program, where you can take your car seat, in this example, the Target and, uh, or Walmart, and uh, you get 20% off, in this case, for your next car seat. And it turns out that when you inject a little purpose into something, this becomes the best driver of car seat sales that they possibly have, better than coupons or advertising or other things. And suddenly, the organization can understand that. And they can respond to that and scale with it. And this is one of the key things in sustainability exercises, is that you, you, can't, you shouldn't champion a sustainability idea on the virtue of sustainability. 
That'll get you in the door, it'll get people interested, but to get it funded, and to get it funded robustly, and then to scale, you need to frame it in what the organization is built to care about. Let me just show you another example uh, of this. Um, we do flip-flop recycling and make it into playgrounds. Like, how lovely is that, right? You know, you can't recycle flip-flops normally, and we collect millions of them, and they turn into playgrounds for schools in need. I mean, warm and fuzzy, you can give the project a big hug and feel awesome. So what's the backdrop economics? Old Navy is the funding uh, on this one. And what do they care about? Selling more flip-flops. And people tend to want to replace their flip-flops just when summer is coming. So they do a big program where you can bring any brand of flip-flop, and they actually want you to bring the competition back to their store, and then you get half off your next uh, flip-flop. And you feel really good because then they're turned into playgrounds for kids in need. And that really, if you frame it that way, uh, it allows uh, you, like an organization like mine that just cares about solving flip-flop waste, uh, to be able to embed it in an organization that cares about selling clothing. And the amazing thing is that garbage can do so many things. Just to show you some extreme examples, here's uh, shipping trucks, uh, where 30% of the shipping truck has been, the plastic parts have been replaced with used post-consumer potato chip bags. This was made for the Super Bowl. Or here's a friend of ours, this is also chip bag recycling, except this would be upcycling, where we made him a jacket uh, to wear. And you know, the interesting business logic on this one is he got paid equally to promote two products. And do you even really notice the second product he's promoting? You know, we talk a lot about ocean plastic. Uh, today, we run at TerraCycle the world's largest supply chain for ocean plastic. And uh, the scary part about ocean plastic, by the way, this is how we think about it. But the vast majority, 95%, sinks to the bottom. There's been no projects. I don't even know how to deal with that, all the stuff that sinks to the bottom. And really, what we're dealing with is stuff that is uh, floating. And you know, the problem uh, with solving something like ocean plastic is that it is an exceptionally expensive process to sift, get all this waste out, and it's also degraded, so it creates a lower quality uh, uh, material than uh, normal recycled plastic. Yet, this at the World Economic Forum in January of 2017 became the world's first shampoo bottle, made 25% from ocean plastic. Since then, this has grown to 20 countries, it's won awards in the UN, and all sorts of great things. And I put this example up because normally the business logic for an organization, this one is Procter & Gamble, um, is they want to buy recycled plastic, but they don't want to spend any more than virgin, and they want the quality of it to be the same as virgin material. So we prefer recycled is the line, except without compromising. And I'm sure if you deal with procurement, you probably run into that issue over and over. We want to be more sustainable, but we don't want to sacrifice the core economics, whether you're looking at you know, converting light bulbs or you know, making something more energy efficient or using ocean plastic, same general issues. And I put up this example because in this case, the ocean plastic is wildly more expensive than normal recycled plastic, not even comparably, but wildly more expensive. And it's low quality, so low, it, that it had to degrade the color of a bottle that is iconically white. This is the first time in the history of the number one shampoo brand in the world they changed the color. That wasn't a positive thing. That'd be like asking McDonald's to go from yellow to purple. Not so easy to accomplish that. So why would they do it? And this is the key thing we find on how do you unlock sustainability principles, and again, have them scale, not just do this once, but have this all over the world and grow and grow, is broaden a little bit the perspective and break apart from those boundaries that would normally be in place. So the boundary here is I want the plastic to be the same price and same quality. Okay, well it isn't, and really isn't, but it does other things. It injects purpose into the product. And when you inject purpose into the product, the consumer by buying this is saving 10 pieces of plastic from her ocean, then you suddenly can really decrease the marketing expense because the earned media, the journalists and the social media will do it for you and in a way more credible way. It suddenly engages uh, employees. More people want to go work at your company. You know, there's all these other points of value and when you can find someone, the right stakeholder, to see all those points of value, simple equation, you shift in this example some marketing dollars over to the polymer budget without changing the price of the product, without changing your profitability, and off you go. And it exists and grows and grows. Um, and then, by the way, what's also really lovely is competitors see it, and this becomes Unilever's version of the exact same thing with us. So hopefully this gives you a taste of how we try to accomplish the things that are usually not possible by just sort of peeling back and thinking about how do you design the business premise uh, a little more broader, and think about what else, what other value can you accomplish? And then, actually, when we were launching this bottle, this was in January 2017, we asked ourselves, are we going to accomplish our mission, which is to eliminate the idea of waste by 
continuing to recycle all sorts of things that are hard to recycle, from diaper recycling to you name it, and, are, and then integrating more waste back into products, which, by the way, are the major promises most consumer product companies have made for 2025. Almost all of them have promised great growth in both those sectors, more recyclable, more recycled content. And we realized that recycling is not the answer to waste. It is the answer to the symptom of waste, but it's not the answer to the root cause of waste. In fact, it's maybe the best way to manage waste. But if you look up the word recycling in a dictionary, its existence depends on the word waste to exist. And it's imperfect. There is no perfect recycling system no matter where you are. And that got us on a journey which ended in this press conference, or really was announced to the world in this press conference. This was back at Davos at the World Economic Forum exactly two years later. Um, you can see myself, but also, you know, we had a pretty interesting sort of group, the CEO of P&G, the CEO of Pepsi, and also the global head of Greenpeace. In fact, the first time Greenpeace and uh, these large consumer product companies were announcing a platform together, which we felt really good about. This platform's called Loop, and it asks the question, how do we solve waste at the root cause? Before telling you sort of how we looked at that, I'm going to play you a little video from the press conference itself. Is recycling and making from recycled materials the only way to solve waste? And we tried to create uh, or think about some alternatives to solve waste at the root cause. And that is how the Loop Alliance was born, which is about offering an alternative to disposability by shifting ownership of the everyday products we buy from the consumer to the manufacturer. Loop is just a, a great illustration because it pushes it even further. It's not about recycling. It's about getting it where it's durable and you can create a truly, a truly circular system. And done well, it'll be as convenient, and it'll be as affordable, and it'll be better performance of the products. The experience will be a positive experience, and it will be one that it significantly reduces the environmental footprint of the total process. And my dream is that my kids or their kids can wake up in a world where the idea of waste simply doesn't exist. Mm. And we look at this time in history as, what an anomaly that was, and thank God we're not in it anymore. <laughs> That gives you a little you taste from the, you know, from the conference. And it hit a nerve. Um, uh, it's been written about over 10,000 times uh, and then launched uh, uh, in Paris uh, on May 14 with Carrefour. By the way, just to interpret this map, all the countries in gray are where we operate as TerraCycle. In blue, as we operate with our public charity, the TerraCycle Foundation. And then Paris was the first city to go live, May 14, with Carrefour. Then uh, Kroger and Walgreens took it live in the northeast of the United States uh, seven days later. Um, in early February, Tesco is taking it live in the UK. In May, Loblaw is bringing it live here in Toronto, uh, from Toronto to Ottawa uh, in Canada. Uh, and then Reva in Germany, Aeon in Japan, and then early 21, uh, Woolworths in Australia. So it's got some really sort of interesting momentum. Now in innovation, you know, I believe that there's sort of two types of innovation. There's one type of innovation that we sort of internally coin as step innovation. That is saying, well, a toothbrush is the best way to clean your teeth, so how do we make the toothbrush better? And you twist the bristles, you change the color, and you have a new toothbrush. Another question is, how do you take a step back? And if you take a step back, you have to ask, well, what's the purpose of a toothbrush? Well, the purpose of a toothbrush is oral hygiene. And then you've got to take one more step back and say, why do we even have an oral hygiene problem to begin with? And if you begin the question there, there's way more opportunities that open up. And where you may get to may not even look like a toothbrush and a toothpaste tube. It may be something wildly different. So let's do that on waste, right? Waste is a completely man-made idea. Uh, it doesn't exist in nature, and one, there's many ways to define waste, but one way to define it is something that uh, is not a useful input to anything else, an output that is not a useful input to anything else. And when you think about when that was invented, that was about the 1950s. Waste is only really 70 years old as an idea. So then the question becomes, well, what was like, life like here in Toronto in the 1940s? And suddenly pictures like this pop up. But it wasn't just the milkman, you know, which is the proverbial sort of iconic idea of reuse. It was also your motor oil, your perfume. We cobbled our shoes. We mended our clothes. Now, just to put this uh, as a statistic, I'm going to, uh, just for fun, I'll ask you. Let's take if we were a 30-year-old uh, woman here in Toronto in 1920, middle income, how many apparel items would have we bought per year? Anyone? You can yell it out. Two, very close. And how long would have we used them, noting we mended and so on, before they became rags and were not clothing anymore? 20 years, that's the average. What is it today? 100 years later, how many apparel items does your average middle income 30-year-old female in Toronto buy? 65. 
And how many, you can't do time anymore, time is too big of a, a metric. How many uses before we throw it out? Three. That's 100 years, what's happened. And so it's not just you know, coffee cups and straws, it's freaking everything has gone into that. So again, what was life like back here is things were durable. They were meant to last a long time. They were designed in a way that they were good go around. That's why you can see milk bottles still in flea markets today. But there was something really interesting from a design point of view that went unnoticed, I think, which is the economic backbone of this model, which is the package would end up becoming an asset to the manufacturer in the end. The milk company would buy it back, return your deposit and take it back. And any asset, you are selfishly, financially motivated to make it long-lasting and durable. The word sustainability didn't exist in his time. It was about, you know, just the, when, you have to, when that milk bottle breaks, you have to replace it so you don't want it to break. Then the 1950s come along and this happens. And by the way, this is a positive photo shot in 1950. 1950s was, must have been an amazing time. You know, your doctor recommends camel cigarettes. You live a throwaway lifestyle. I mean, God, I was born in the wrong decade. Um, so here, this came in. And we could look at this photo as a horrible photo. But let's honor it. What is it trying to promote? It's promoting that disposability is unbelievably convenient and affordable relative to the way the world was. It frees you up from being slave to your kitchen. You know, you don't have to wash the dishes, just throw them out. Those are actual advertisements that ran back then. But a really strange thing happened. The package moved from being the property of the manufacturer in the end to the property of the consumer. And as a result, became a cost of goods sold or a cog to the manufacturer. Now, let me ask you, you know, you've drank coffee recently, right? In a, like at a coffee shop, is that fair? And when you bought your coffee, you bought the coffee and it came in a disposable cup. And you know, all of that is your property. I presume you consumed the coffee and then you had the cup, which is your property. So how long have you cherished that cup? Just for half a day, that's it. And this is weird, 99% of what we buy, we don't want to own. That is so strange that we own things that we don't want to own and it's the vast majority of things we interact with. And when it becomes a cost of goods sold to the manufacturer, the goal of the coffee shop is to make your coffee cup as cheap as possible. And then this happens. This is Pepsi, one of the founding partners of Loop, and their packaging trend from when they began, refillable bottles, to where they're trending today, pouches. And by the way, everything in packaging is trending towards a pouch. Now the benefit of going from the heavy glass bottle to the light pouch is that the pouch is way cheaper, way, way cheaper, so the cost of the product goes up, profit goes up, so your profit goes up, costs go down. The other is that it's way more sustainable in its creation. It's way less material use than the heavy glass bottle. Those are huge positives. But there's two unintended negatives. The line you see is the actual rate of recycling for each of these pack forms in North America today. And it crashes down, and the reason it crashes down, they're all technically recyclable, it's just it's progressively less profitable for a garbage company to do so, and at a pouch, it's more cost to collect and recycle than the results are worth, so no one does it. But there's another, maybe even more important negative to producers. And let's just, if you guys can all answer this together, let's see if we can get a consensus. If you had a peer in front of you right now, any beverage you wanted, a half liter of it, which packaging form would you like it in? Can you all answer that together? Is that you, anyone disagree? Okay. What about the least favorite packaging form that you'd like that to show up in front of you? Okay, so let's, we unanimously agree that it's an order of degrading consumer delight. And that really sucks. Those are the two negatives. So the thesis question for Loop, before we knew the answer was, how do you solve the unintended consequences of disposability, the garbage crisis, and the quality of products going down tremendously? I mean, look at a Monopoly board today compared to a Monopoly board 30 years ago. It's the same game. The only difference is the pieces are just more crap in how they're made. You know, 30 years ago, the Monopoly board was like solid wood houses and, and hotels. Now it's like little thin plastic. And by the way, fun side story on Monopoly. I, I, I love, you know, capitalism. And did you know Monopoly was invented in the Great Depression as a, by communists, basically, socialists, to vilify capitalism. That's how it was invented. And the joke was you'd all get together, you know, comrade, we'd sit and we'd drink and, uh, and uh, the joke was there would be one evil monopolist who'd win in the end and all, everyone else would be bankrupt. That was literally the way the game was invented. Then it goes away. Then it comes back like 10 years later and becomes the icon of capitalism with no game changes whatsoever. Isn't that like brilliantly poetic, right? And now we all want to be the capitalists and everyone else still goes bankrupt. So anyway, 
so the question became, how do we want to maintain the, uh, the unintended consequences of disposability, or, or, or sorry, solve those while maintaining the virtues, which is affordability and convenience? And this is the really important thing we learned about design is that there is so much wisdom in our past and in nature. And in design, we always think about the future, 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 and we disregard the past, and there's so many really smart answers. So the answer actually came from reinventing an old idea, which is shift ownership back to the manufacturer. So close to me on this projector, you see a Unilever deodorant stick uh, under the Axe brand. We put that up because that is not recyclable today for four reasons. It's black plastic, it's multi-polymer, it's contaminated with deodorant, and it's small. So the designers at Unilever would have to solve four ridiculously profound issues to make that blue box recyclable. It's a low cost, like any disposable pack, but the entire, and these are made up numbers, they're just placeholders, but the entire cost is embedded into the price of your deodorant. You buy that package, and does anyone here wanna own it once they're done using their deodorant? Anybody? Yet, we all buy it, we all own it. On the right hand side, you see the new deodorant stick Unilever designed exclusively for Loop. It's beautiful stainless steel, I would argue, maybe the most beautiful deodorant stick designed to date. If anyone has a better one, just tell me. Um, but it's expensive to do that. There's no way to do such design and keep it cheap. But, and this is the key but, Unilever buys it back at the end. Which means what is in the price of your deodorant is just the depreciation of that durable container plus the cost of cleaning. And that actually becomes very similar to the price of the disposable container, which allows you, without spending any more money, to enable durable design. Durable design is not just about reuse. These are reusable, right? When this is done, you throw them out, we clean them and fill them with more deodorant. This will start shipping in a few months. But it also enables new features and benefits that were never possible before. Let me take you on a tour of what I mean by this. Here, for example, is uh, North America's number one laundry detergent now in loop. This is what it looks like in real life. Suddenly Tide is in a stainless steel, beautiful, reusable container. Here is what ice cream now looks like with Nestle, with haagen -Dazs. And this is a great example where, yes, this is reusable, 75% better from a carbon impact point of view than a disposable package, but it also solves for all of the wildly profound issues of ice cream packaging. So let me walk you through this as an example for design. So, where do you think, I don't know if this is true for the average Canadian, but I think it is, but I'm certain this is true for the average American. Uh, where do you think our average friends down south eat ice cream at home, the most common place to eat a pint of ice cream in their home? Sorry? Couch, in bed, number one. And this is a loaded question, what do you, this is three and a half servings, what do you think the average consumption volume is? The whole thing, right? So you eat the whole thing in bed, so what do you think are the issues that come from that type of consumption experience. What do you think the complaints are that come in through customer service to hug and us? Anyone? Yell it out, because I can hardly hear you. Sorry, someone said melts, melts too fast. Absolutely, it's in top four, yeah. What else? Sorry? Yes, number one issue, right there. It's like, uh, you know, what's that game? Family feud, right? You know, absolutely, survey says. Number one issue is your hands get cold. So cold is that people send in photos of wearing mittens, gloves, and everything. <laughs> no, I, can you imagine holding frozen, you know, something frozen for that long? So it also, the package gets yucky by the end. It's sort of like not so much fun to deal with it, at the end. The bottoms, it's hard to get the last scoops out of the bottom because they're right angles, and your spoon is not conducive to a right angle scoop out. Um, and it also melts from the outside in, so you get ice cream floating in ice cream soup near the, you know, half the experience. And this solves all those earth-shattering issues. It's double wall stainless steel, which gives it a thermal barrier, and that means that from the outside it's warm while the inside is negative 18 Celsius or less. It melts from the top down, which is like the perfect melting pattern. The inside layer is ultra concave, which means you can get every last scoop out easily. Um, and it's, of course, incredibly beautiful. And that's the point of durable design. It's not just about sustainability, it's about the future of how to consume, and in the future, everything is better. Oh, and by the way, it's also significantly more uh, sustainable. This is made to have 100 uses, and at the end, 
of the 100 or plus uses, it's recycled back into itself. And then it has another 100 uses, and then it's recycled back into itself. Just to show you some more examples, this is Clorox wipes. Here, the wipes are collected back and recycled, and the container is reused and refilled with wipes. Here's Cascade soap, uh, uh, engineered plastic. By the way, we vilify plastic. Plastic is not bad. I don't think actually any material is bad. I don't think it can be good or bad. It's the act of using it once, I think, is the real issue here, right? Um, and this can go around over and over and over. And in fact, what they notice here is people were now proudly displaying the container instead of hiding their Cascade below uh, the counter. Even companies you would never expect doing fierce sustainability are now getting involved. Here is one of the biggest fossil fuel companies releasing what I would think is the most beautiful uh, uh, um, lubricant container ever, stainless steel. In fact, people are coming to this not because they want to you know, have sustainability, because they want to have incredible design, and then they're behaving like the biggest hippie by having it all get reused and so on and so forth. And that's the key I think we need to do, is we need to play into what people want but make the back-end structures incredibly sustainable. So in this container by Shell, you get your motor oil, you put it in your car, you put the used oil back into it, you drop it off like garbage, we take the used oil, recycle it, clean the container, and it gets refilled, and around it goes. Some companies are bringing back iconic ideas, like Coke bringing back the original bottle, because why reinvent something that's sort of perfect? Turns out, by the way, if you like beverages, like carbonated beverages, and you blind taste Coca-Cola in glass versus aluminum versus um, PET, an average non-sophisticated consumer will tell the difference blind and say the glass tastes best, then the aluminum, then the PET. So it turns out the ingredient even can get affected. It could be companies thinking about you know, how to bring back things they never did, like Tropicana and Quaker going into stainless steel or refillable glass. Even very simple ideas like your mayonnaise for the first time ever can be refilled, or your salad dressing for the first time ever can go into refillable. We started realizing this idea of counterworthiness. This is seventh generation now doing packaging that is incredibly counterworthy. In fact, crazy stat, 40% of people in North America who buy dish soap pour it into a different container when they get home. Any of you do that? And do, it can't be a sustainability move because you're throwing out the bottle when you're there, right? So it's gotta be entirely for design, right? Um, it could be whether it's Mondelez, which uh, here you would view it as uh, Mr. Christie's. Uh, in Europe, it's uh, Milka, you know, doing now beautiful containers. Even retailers are putting in all of their, you'll see this with Loblaw as well, putting in their private label products. Because we found that there's hundreds of products in a retail environment that are reuse friendly. Just no one ever gave a reuse system behind the scenes for it. So here, you don't have to change the design of the package at all, it just now can go to reuse. But then when the largest olive oil company in France says, let's do it, this is what olive oil will end up looking like in a few months from now. Design is so important. So for example, this is Pantene, shipping now, for the first time ever in reusable aluminum. And an interesting sort of you know, thing came up here is usually people buy one, two shampoos for every one conditioner. That's the average sales ratio in a retailer. Two shampoos for every one conditioner. In Loop, everyone's buying Pantene one-to-one. -one. And we were surveying people asking, like, why are you doing that? It's twice the amount of conditioner you should buy. And everyone was saying, oh, no, 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 it looks good together. <laughs> like, talk about the power of design on how we behave. Now, an interesting problem start coming up in reusable design. One is things age. You know, in normal disposable design, it's all supposed to be shiny, brand new. This is going to go from bathroom to bathroom to bathroom to bathroom. It's going to get scratched. It's going to get dinged. So we had to come up with a whole nomenclature around design with the concept of aging gracefully. This is an example, nothing to do with loop, but it's pretty inspiring. This is Puma making a shoe. And they impregnated the Puma logo in wax into the shoe. You can see the new version behind it, which only becomes visible when you get it dirty. It's an idea of aging gracefully. Here's a, uh, uh, another example, not us, by the way, this one. Uh, this is one we really like, which is a cup, where they glaze the cup selectively, which means as you drink tea from it, over, over, and over, and over, it stains, and the pattern becomes uh, uh, visible. And you would never see the pattern unless you used it. So while this is Pantene now, they took this idea, and this is what Pantene's gonna look like next year. I would say maybe the most beautiful shampoo container ever, but that's just me. Um, what they did here to make this age gracefully is instead of making the logo with ink, they're doing all the artwork with two layers of metal. So the outside layer, which is going to attract scratches faster than the inside layer is what they cut out the art and the logo from, which means as this goes from bathroom to bathroom, the contrast ratio between the outside layer and the inside layer gets higher and higher and higher. So the scratching becomes a virtue, not a negative. You know, it's, to me, it's so interesting to see how companies are uh, thinking about design in this platform. Here, for example, is luxury skincare with Unilever, uh, shipping now, refillable glass. 
And they wanted to really push design, so this is what it's gonna likely look like next year. Just as reusable, but you know, incredibly forward-thinking design. Or here's coffee, number one coffee in Europe, shipping now and reusable. And this is what it's likely gonna look like next year. And in fact, this is also designed with aging gracefully. The artwork wears off strategically in the contact points on the fill line. So where you see where, where it hits fill line contact points, the artwork is made to come off. So as it uh, ages, um, you can be more and more proud of it. I want to give you an example of a category for how people had to start changing their thinking. Oral care. So we first started with oral care with mouthwash. And thought, interesting, people who'd never used mouthwash before now started buying this because it just made their bathroom look so good. And maybe they're going to be more you know, hygienic for their spouse. Then we had to think about toothpaste. Now, toothpaste was tough because the tube can't be made to be reusable today. In today's tech, you can't make a reusable tube. So Unilever, who made the toothpaste, reinvented it to become a glass jar. But then you have a design problem because the paste is not going to be so nice to take out of a glass jar, so they reinvented the toothpaste to be single-dose dehydrated tablets, which now gives you perfect dosage, because if you've ever seen a photo of a toothbrush with toothpaste, the thing, the toothpaste, is called the nurdle, that's the trade term for it, the, the, that sort of idea, is about five times overdosed. It's way too much toothpaste. So now you get perfect dosage, no water, so to say, you know, all the water's gone, and you can even travel with it. So we needed to, you know, this is one of the important things here. You'll notice that this is a multi-stakeholder collaboration. Just like the presentation before on the British Columbia education system, you can't do it alone. It requires all these people to act in unison. And many people have asked us, how do you design a system which requires tons of stakeholders and get everyone to behave together? And the biggest learning we had here is you cannot run things like a consortium. If you get a consortium and everyone gets together in a hall like this and you get all those circle tables and post-it notes and whiteboards and you brainstorm the future, you can never get across the finish line because you're running by consensus and by consensus you're gonna dilute anything exciting to basically nothing or no action will occur. And so the way we run Loop as a multi-stakeholder coalition is we have, Loop is the, the entity Loop, the people who are Loop, are sort of like the chairman of the organ. Everyone gets their point of view. Everyone, all the stakeholders get together. Uh, just uh, uh, two weeks ago at the United Nations Climate Week, we had a big meeting of all the stakeholders about a room like this. Everyone can meet each other. But there's, everyone is given permission that one actor makes the decision so we can make decisions that may be unpopular to move everything forward. That's one really valuable thing. Another really valuable thing is lines in the sand, dates that cannot be argued. So at the very beginning of Loop, we made a decision that we're going to announce this at the World Economic Forum, which is January 20-something, 20 22, 23, and that is the date, and everyone aligned. And so you, could, you draw these lines in the sand, and we always focus on these lines in the sand, like Loblaw is launching here in May, and that's a line in the sand, and all the Canadian suppliers now have to work within that line in the sand. It also, this idea of this sort of multi-stakeholder collaboration with the chairman is important because you can set rules. We needed to set rules on reusable, and we did that um, by having all these stakeholders come together under the auspices of the forum, including the United Nations, Greenpeace, everyone, to agree to what the hell is a reusable package. So we came up with three criteria. The first criteria is the package must be cleanable. Everyone's going to agree to that because it's a health and safety question. The second is it must be durable, and this was a tough one. How many uses is reusable? I mean, for sure it's more than one, but is two uses a reusable package? Is three? It's just like, if you're going to convert a farm from conventional farming to organic farming, do you have to have two years of organic practices, three or four? That's arbitrary, frankly. There's no right answer. So someone I just have to pick three, and everyone agrees that that is now the number. So we pick 10, just because it's the lowest two-digit number. That's it. No other good reason. And then the third thing is it has to have a good life cycle analysis, and the simplest way to do that is it must be recyclable into itself at the end of life. And products, this is the really amazing thing about Loop is that in normal product design, the garbage companies only react to the product way late when it shows up in the waste, and then they gotta figure out how to recycle it. They're never at the table in the actual design process. No one asks the garbage company, should we design this? Would you like this? You know, uh, it doesn't happen. Here, though, a company can't create a product and sell it unless it fits the principles that the garbage company wants. They're designing into it. So, you know, we talked about packaging, but we had this question then on content, because content just becomes waste just as much as anything else. So we've made the first decision that we're not going to have, if the content cannot be recovered, like window cleaner or salad dressing or orange juice, we have no point of view. But what about content that can be recovered? And in, back into this oral care example comes a toothbrush. A toothbrush is content that can be recovered. So this became the first toothbrush in loop, manual toothbrush. Again, I would argue the most brilliant toothbrush ever. Um, 
And here, the package is like a sunglass case, like you know, a silk type case, so it's reusable. We wash it and put a new toothbrush into it. But what about the brush? When the brush comes back, so this is content that is reasonable to recover, so we first set a rule that the consumer has to have the ability to easily recover it. And then what do we do with it? So we realize that within content that's easily, uh, reasonable to recover, there's two subcategories. There's parts of it that are unreasonable to reuse, like the head of a toothbrush. No, I can't imagine, would anyone here be comfortable, even if I surgically sterilize this thing, to use someone else's used brush head? Anyone? No one, okay. But would you be comfortable using the bottom if it was sterilized? Everyone here pretty good? Anyone not okay with the bottom being used on, uh, again? So basically, this brush was made to come apart when it comes back to us. The top goes to recycling. So the rule was if it's reasonable to recover, but unreasonable to reuse, it must get recycled. So what we're doing with diapers, razor blades, toothbrush heads, and so on. And if it's reasonable to recover and reasonable to reuse, it must go to reuse. And this is, I think, the important part in sustainability because if you think about before you saw this, what would be the most sustainable toothbrush out there? Maybe a bamboo toothbrush comes to your mind, right? And a bamboo toothbrush is maybe more uh, sustainable, even though compostable packaging is a whole horrendous thing and it's a whole different topic. But um, uh, uh, So we put that even into maybe better. But every other aspect of it from a design point of view is not as good as a normal toothbrush. It's not as ergonomically designed. It doesn't have as good bristles, blah, 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 blah. Here you get all of it together, and this becomes the new uh, toothbrush. So I've showed you products, but the other part of this equation, which we haven't talked about yet, is how you buy this stuff, is the retailers. And we wanted to bring the retailers along as well uh, uh, and make this something that retailers could embed into their ecosystem. So if you go to, say, loblaw.ca here in Canada slash loop, you'll see that page, or many other leading retailers around the world. And the way we do it with the retailer is that they can embed the offering into their digital first and later physical store ecosystem. But we realize that consumers are sort of horrible people, right? Consumers, we're all evil people when you think about how we shop at 2 a.m. on Amazon. It's not a good thing. We don't care about anything but ourselves, right? We want cheap, awesome, convenient. You know, and it doesn't matter if the turtles are dying and the rainforest is being you know, completely butchered. We are really not good actors. And okay. That's the way it is. It sort of sucks, you know, that, that, that that's what it is. But I think it's better to accept that and then work within that constraint than to hope people will be better. Because if you believe the Earth has 10 years before irreversible climate change damage or whatever metric you're looking at, I mean, we're in the middle of a mass extinction right now, we are not good actors. Even the enlightened ones of us act generally pretty bad because it's so hard to be conscious of everything. And so the answer was, let's not debate that, let's play into that. Consumers want to throw away experience. You know, they want to be able to put everything in the garbage. So the way the platform works is when you buy it uh, uh, online, it gets delivered to you in a reusable uh, container, so no cardboard, no bubble wrap, nothing like that, no dry ice. And you, you put the products out there, you use them, but when you're done, no cleaning, no uh, washing, no refilling yourself, you throw it back into one of these containers like garbage. We actually want you to proudly feel like it's garbage. Then we pick it up from your home like a garbage company, check it in, return your deposits, clean the packaging, send it back to the product companies, and around it goes. And if it's bought at store, you get not a heavy-duty thing like this, but a very light, reusable garbage bag that you put in your garbage bin. You throw all your loop stuff in there like garbage, pr uh, proudly. When the bag is full, you take the whole bag, and you drop it off at any participating retailer. We've had some of the world's biggest restaurants and coffee shops recently join. So you could buy at Loblaw and drop off at one of them. You could buy your hamburger french fries at one of the world's biggest fast food restaurants, suit in reusable packaging, and drop it off at a retailer. It doesn't matter. It needs to be as convenient as throwing something away. And I want to leave you with this last idea. We came to Loop as a garbage company, wanting to help solve waste at the root cause by moving from single-use to multi-use packaging and product. And in the process, we realized that we have a design juggernaut on our hands. We never realized a design opportunity till it hit us in the face that by moving to durable packaging, you can wildly increase the investment in design and do things that were never possible before. 
And then about a year ago, we realized that we have another really interesting thing on our hand that we never realized, which is now we have a relationship with your used product. Not your used product in aggregate like a landfill, but your actual used product. So how does, why is that important? Today when you shop online, you can go and see your order history. You can see everything you ordered. Any website will show you what you ordered in the past. But with Loop, we also know what you returned. And the difference between those two things it's, is what is in your home real time right now. That actually becomes really interesting really quickly. What can you do with that? Well, one example that we're building out with one of the grocery stores is end of this year, you're going to be able to get an email notification. X days, you set X at whatever you want, say five days before anything in your home is going to expire. So you don't discover the pasta sauce two months old in your pantry. You're told, hey, your pasta sauce and your suntan lotion is about to expire. You know, go on the beach and eat some pasta and don't throw it out. <laughs> Another interesting example is uh, by having a relationship with the used product, you can actually set subscription models to be not based on time, like every subscription model today is based on an increment of time, but based on actual use. So you can set it so that your empty product, when we pick it up, the garbage triggers the order of the next product. And in fact, in branded goods, consumers are choosing this at somewhere between 25 and 55% of their orders, they're setting the product to be auto refill when returned. So when you send back your old Tide, it triggers the order of the next one. And you don't have to worry about going on vacation for six months, then nothing shows up, and then you have, if you have a Tide party, a lot will show up. You know, so you can really set it to be exactly the way you want Again, it's sort of future, but also cutting a lot of waste out in the actual process. And there's really sort of dynamic uh, things you can do. Uh, the most advanced example of having a relationship with the used product is a division we spun off of Loop called TerraCycle Diagnostics, which has the thesis that there's certain waste streams that carry diagnosable samples, that by diagnosing them can make your life better. So for example, your air conditioned filter carries samples of your air. Wouldn't it be nice that when you send in your used air conditioned filter, you can opt in, pay a little extra fee, and then we tell you the levels of mold in your house. Or your cat's kitty litter carries with it its urine and fecal samples. And that can be diagnosed with existing technology and tell you if your cat has urinary tract infection and or even customize your cat food to automatically help solve for any ailments that may be coming. Your diaper carries your child's fecal matter. Your toothbrush carries your uh, saliva. Your femcare product carries menstrual blood. Your um, uh, razor blade carries hair. Your motor oil carries the engine shavings of your car and can be diagnosed with today's technology to tell you about the health of the inside of your car engine. And this is, I think, one of the really interesting things that we have as an opportunity. I think in sustainability, we need to not focus on sacrifice. We need to focus on how do we reinvent the future within the context of sustainability. To solve problems, we need to take a step back and understand not just how to solve them, what tools we're using, but why does the problem even exist? And to do all that, to get organizations to want to do it, frame it in what they care about most. Frame it in their primary motivator, not what you care about. And hopefully that gives you a little taste on how we're trying to think about the idea of waste just a little differently. Thank you and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you.